Good afternoon, everyone. That camera's super close. Is it an afternoon? I don't know. Jury's still out. Great. All right. Well, good afternoon, I'm going to say. Uh, my name's Kevin Lucas. I'm the Curator of Education here at the DAR Museum in Washington, D.C. Hopefully you've seen me before. Uh, you can come to one of, our, one of our other great programs where I've hosted or, or been the uh, sort of main attraction, so to speak. Um, if you're not familiar with the DAR Museum, we're a uh, beautiful museum here in Washington, D.C. Uh, that is supported by and founded by the Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, a heritage organization that started in 1890 for women to celebrate their ancestors who supported the American Revolution in some way. So uh, all these years later, the DAR has this wonderful museum in downtown or right next to the White House. And we have a lot of different objects in our museum, everything from furniture to dresses to quilts, what we call the decorative art, uh, a lot of things that were in people's homes. And this gives us a really great window into American history that you don't see in a lot of other places. Uh, as we go through this massive collection that we have and we work with, uh, it's incredible to see how much there's still to talk about. And one of the things that we definitely can still talk about in this museum that we have really just started to scratch the surface on is how many of these objects relate to the institution of chattel slavery, which is what we're gonna talk about today, is how objects in the museum that have typically been viewed as property of, of elite white wealthy people uh, equally tell stories of Black Americans that actually help us understand something like slavery a lot uh, in a more fuller way, uh, a lot more comprehensively. So this thing that we're going to be looking at today, this uh, house divided uh, is what we ended up calling it, mostly because I spent way too long at a uh, Lincoln Museum and now I'm just permanently sort of stuck in the Lincoln mindset. So this comes from our new offering of educational resources. So my wife's a teacher. I'm a big fan of bringing museum content into classrooms. I love working with children and working with classrooms and helping really expand all of the good work that's already going on in a lot of classrooms. So this year we've been putting together this Lessons from the American Home. It's a series of lesson plans that are about American history, but more focused in trying to understand American history from a different lens through their homes, through their dining rooms, through their parlors, through their kitchens. Better Than Box is a program uh, that we did in April, uh, sometime this spring. It was so much fun talking about cake and how that provides a unique lens to American history. Out of Many One is a great lesson we have about using museum databases. Create a Period Room is probably going to be its own thing later, but it's up there now. What we're doing today, we also have a series of short object lessons you may have gone to uh, this past year that we had a lot of fun with. And then brand new, uh, just this uh, past couple weeks, is we've created some short coloring activities for younger students. So they involve a lot of different things in the museum's uh, collection, such as this dress from 1863. It talks a little bit about the, the sort of iconic, notable uh, pieces of the dress, and then gives you a little bit of information about uh, fashion at the time. And also this quilt, which I love this one, just because I love the little patterns to color in. Uh, and I think these are going to be really fun. And we can't wait to see classrooms use them and schools and libraries. And we hope to see people bring them into their homes as well. But today we're going to look at a house divided. Uh, this lesson was inspired by the program we did for Black History Month, where we looked at one of our period rooms and sort of tried to view it through the lens of slavery specifically, and not just the wealthy owners who were sitting in the room and, and enjoying it. So we talked about that. And this is the room that inspired this. So if you've been to the DAR Museum, you might recognize this. Uh, this period room is in our lower level of Memorial Continental Hall. Uh, period rooms are very interesting constructs, I think you might call them. Uh, they originally, when they're put together, a period room is just really more of an artistic expression where it says, let's pick a room in a museum or an art gallery and just put out some really fine pieces from a certain era or a certain region or just to a certain taste. And then as they sort of get criticized in the 20th century, they begin to become more historic. And you have a range of period rooms uh, and what they can represent, where you still have an art gallery of period rooms that don't really mean to tell a historic narrative, but are really just a collection of art pieces to what we have in the museum, where we have recreations of spaces, of real historic spaces, and then these evidence-backed period rooms. So this period room here is meant to depict sort of a Southern 
dining room uh, around the 1820s, and all of it's inspired by things like print, um, accounts, historical sites, a lot of primary evidence. And this one specifically is one of our favorites, I think for a lot of people who come in the museum, the North Carolina room is one of the more popular, partly because it's um, truly a really beautiful room, uh, especially the way the wallpaper works, a lot of the accents in the room I really like. Uh, and then on top of that, it is very obviously depicting a really specific moment. You know, you see all the discarded napkins on the chairs and on the table, you see all these fruits and desserts laid out these dishes on the dumbwaiter here that have been set aside. Clearly, this is a very elegant dinner party that is just wrapped up. And that's the initial pre impression that it gives. I mean, it's so strong when you're there in the basement and you feel that moody lighting. Um, it's kind of warm and cozy and fun. But when you really think about this space and what it would have been like, it's not just these, you know, elegant society types sitting in the chairs, but around the edges of the room, coming in and out of the room, there are enslaved black Americans who are serving food, they're bringing in and out uh, alcohol and desserts and, and all these sorts of things. And then even uh, something I don't think a lot, you know, there's no air conditioning in this time. But you know, this image here, which is a artistic image created from a description of an enslaved person uh, from 1848, is fanning the individual guests. So that's really a much more accurate depiction of the room is this very awkward and uncomfortable recognition that while there's this bright cheery dinner party happening there are this very macabre morbid these enslaved people standing like shadows against the edges of the room and that's something that i personally really like to make sure that impression is given that and particularly with what this period room is depicting and when this is the scene that it would be and there's no avoiding this scene it's so present throughout all of the north carolina room and it's not just the north carolina room I picked this room to talk about slavery a lot because it contains so much sugar, which was so intimately tied to the, the system of slavery. Uh, but really, most of our period rooms could discuss slavery in this exact same way, and not just the Southern ones as well. I frequently bring up uh, New York is set around the same time period, and they would have experienced slavery in a different way, but still really intimately in their home spaces. So what we're gonna do today to try to communicate that a little bit more and more specifically, is we're gonna look at specific objects in the collection, and we're going to just sort of suss out and look at it and, and piece apart the object for what it is by looking at the museum's catalog of it, which is basic information. And then we'll look at some primary sources that describe the object a little bit from different perspectives to think about how these objects can be seen and interpreted in different ways based on what story you're trying to highlight and who you're trying to talk about. Ooh, that's the introduction. Uh, the one thing that I, I didn't mention yet that I want, just a mechanical thing, as we go, um, this, we're going to try to keep this a, a little brief. I don't want to spend all afternoon uh, on this with you. It's also fairly repetitive. This is a, uh, a lesson plan designed for use with older students. Um, and I'm very much of belief, and I was taught the way I was trained in my, my skill set, is that kids can handle really big, really heavy thoughts if you scaffold it correctly and you build it out and you flush it out correctly for them. Uh, so my hope in my mind is that these programs should be designed for children, but should be just as relevant for adults, which is why I do them uh, as virtual programs here. Um, but they have been designed as well to keep in mind that teachers have uh, really rigid, but also chaotic schedules. Um, you know, they, my wife is a teacher, like I said, and she's a big planner. So she always starts off with high ambition, but very rigid. We're going to do this and this and this. But then student needs come in and, and other problems come up where you can't always keep to that schedule. So we try to make all of our lesson plans modular where you can take in and out pieces as you need them. And so this lesson plan is designed specifically in case studies where we have a single object with a pairing of sources and some questions to help lead discussion. And each one sort of hits on similar topics so that if you only do one, you're still getting the maximum uh, sort of big picture. But if you want to combine them, they tell a different story once you have them all together and have all that pieces to create that big puzzle. Uh, and that's, that is really important to us because we want to make sure that any type of classroom is able to utilize these resources the way that's best for them uh, because we don't know. 
But as we're going, feel free to ask questions during the program. You'll have a little gray bar on your Zoom that says like chat, has your mute button stuff. Uh, hit that little chat bubble and it should pop up a little box. If there's anything that you think of as you're going, uh, please feel free to interrupt. Since we're, uh, the Tuesday talks sort of range in length when we do these, uh, but I don't want to take this too long. So I'm just gonna give you sort of the cliff notes for the tray, uh, the idea of it, and then we're gonna deep dive into the other two case studies here uh, in the program. So this tray is actually what inspired this program. Um, it was made in Maine and it's just, uh, it's tollware, so it's painted tin, but it's very beautiful. I think very simply elegant. I love the leaves on this. I could stare at this all day. It's just one of those very simple, but beautiful things. Uh, but I was introduced to this tray through a tour that we created in 2020, uh, where it was about objects that were used by servants and the enslaved. And the focus was more on etiquette. And at the time, this was the interpretation that we did, where we talked about the physical use of the tray and just how it was used by a servant or an enslaved person based on this source written by a, a black man named Robert Roberts. And that's certainly one way to talk about it and an important thing to talk about because it tells us the function and the purpose of the tray. But what I thought of when I saw this tray was of uh, Mary Prince, who was an enslaved woman who had a narrative uh, that she, I believe she dictated it or she wrote it in 1831. So it's one of the earlier enslaved narratives. And she tells a story where she was carrying a bunch of plates and knives and she dropped the pile and they shattered. And she was uh, struck, quote, severely for this. And so to me, this tray is about etiquette and it's about dining culture and it's about tin work. But for an enslaved person who's carrying in and out dishes from a space where breaking a dish or cracking it would have caused a physical punishment, that tray is something much different to them. And it's not just about its physical purpose to carry plates. It's a physical shield from, from physical punishment. And it's also an emotional support. I, I can't imagine the type of nervousness that could go into carrying something like a, like a bunch of wine glasses uh, when the punishment for breaking that is, is so scary. So this is a, the second case study. There's a tool up here. I just call it a cast iron tool. Uh, I'm not sure how many how many kids would recognize this. I don't know how many households still make these at home, but I'm sure you guys can guess what this is by looking at it. It's sort of iconic teeth. Uh, it's a waffle maker, of course. It's got these long, long handles that you can reach the waffle maker into the fire. It's also got uh, you can see it, this little loop right here. Uh, I thought that was to keep it closed. But according to the museum database, that ring was to, to lock the arms together and then be able to hang it up uh, next to the fire. So I like that it has uh, storage considerations as well. So this uh, waffle iron was made in sometime between 1785 and 1810. So it's a pretty early, really important couple decades there in the United States. And this is what a waffle recipe looked like. Uh, this is from the 1780s, so around the same time period that this waffle iron was created. So you guys can pull up the chat box, like I said, by clicking that little speech bubble there. Uh, could you put for me, just to, just to talk about it and think about it so I can rest my voice for a second. How is this recipe from, uh, different from a modern waffle recipe? Just looking at it real quickly, what can you see there that's different than how we make waffles today, generally? sort of one of these things is not like the other. You have the, the two speech bubbles, but next to that should be the chat, which is just a single speech bubble. So David White says that brandy isn't used today. I've never put brandy in waffles. I don't know how you guys make it in your home, but uh, just absolutely fascinated to what that would taste like. There's also a couple other things that I would not put in waffles and I've never seen used in a modern recipe. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people uh, not using alcohol. And then a lot of people, uh, I don't think, use rose water in any regular, uh, as a cooking, what do you call that, ingredient. 
I don't know if we're putting ginger into a ton of waffles. I love a good savory waffle myself sometimes, some sesame, some ginger. Uh, but I don't think we're putting that in most of our breakfast waffles. And yeah, does it say flour? If I remember correctly, so um, something that's really interesting about early recipes is that they function off of a really high level of assumed knowledge, which is not true anymore. Uh, most cookbooks today are written assuming that that's your first cookbook. And so you'll find a lot of times in recipes, they live out, leave out big things like putting flour into bread or waffles because they assume that you know you've got to add flour to a certain degree. Uh, or they won't put measurements quite right. They'll put like put a nice amount of butter into the recipe um, or they'll use visual cues, like make it half eggs and half sugar. So these historic recipes can be a bit difficult to parse out. And a lot of that's because they're coming from, um, the chat is disabled, that's strange. We'll see if we can fix that as I'm, as I'm going. Um, but a lot of these recipes came from oral translations or transcriptions uh, where it's recipes passed down for a really long time and finally someone decides to write it down. They're not always super textbook accurate. They're also quite rich. If you look at these, it makes a lot of waffles, two quarts of milk and a whole dozen eggs. Uh, that's going to be quite quite a bit of waffles for one one serving. Yeah, and we have a lot of other things saying it doesn't tell you how to uh, how to combine things or in what order. I wonder why the chat's disabled. You never know what's going to not work when you pop into one of these. But thank you guys for being so uh, so creative and using the Q and A function instead. So that's a recipe of waffles. To compare that, so, oh, the big point of that being um, the richness, the, the fact that there's so much butter, so many eggs, and so much sugar, is that sugar at the time that we're talking about, is, the early 1800s especially, is very expensive and cost prohibitive. It's gonna get to a point during like the 1830s, 1840s, where sugar becomes increasingly achievable as like a, sort of a common luxury, you might say. Um, but at this time, it's still going to be pretty pretty expensive. So it's not something that you're going to eat every day. But thinking about the type of family that would inhabit a space like the North Carolina room, it's something they might be familiar with, depending on their condition and what they're into. In comparison, I want to show you guys this, this bit from the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. There are a lot of enslaved narratives that were produced or written uh, in the 19th century. And in the 1930s, there's a huge explosion of available sources about slavery. Uh, thanks to the Great Depression, there was the, the WPA created to create a lot of jobs for a lot of different people. And one of those groups of people were writers and historians. And they put them onto a project to uh, record oral histories from enslaved people who were still alive. At this point, they're going to be quite old or they were quite young when slavery ended uh, formally in the 1860s, chattel slavery. Uh, but Despite this plethora of sources, Frederick Douglass is one of the most often quoted enslaved narratives. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that this narrative has been highly scrutinized and it's been fact checked you know, throughout the last century. And also Frederick Douglass himself is like a celebrity figure. Uh, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people are familiar with who Frederick Douglass is. So we can attach a face to the narrative. That being said, uh, I did include a different enslaved narrative, but because we, we are aiming this at students, we do want to still keep that bridge where we say, this is Frederick Douglass. This is a name that you're going to see a lot, a name that you should be familiar with as an American student learning history. But also Frederick Douglass's experience in mostly in Maryland, right there in the mid-Atlantic, um, it's very indicative of a lot of trends that cover chattel slavery all over the country. So while his, his experience is specific to him, we'll find it's very representative of mid-Atlantic chattel slavery and also has a lot in common with how chattel slavery was practiced in the South, but not entirely. So that's a little caveat to these sources. Um, he's also a fantastic writer, so uh, I enjoy how these are put together. So here, you may have already been reading ahead. Frederick Douglass is talking about receiving a monthly allowance of food where uh, the individual slaves from all of the farms were given uh, a year's worth of clothes and a monthly allowance of food. The men and women received as their monthly allowance of food eight pounds of pork or its equivalent in fish and one bushel of cornmeal. 
it skips ahead because then he starts talking about specifically uh, that children were sort of fed communally. He says, our food was coarse cornmeal boiled. This was called mush. It was put into a large wooden tray or trough and set down upon the ground. The children were then called like so many pigs. And like so many pigs, they would come and devour the mush, some with oyster shells, others with pieces of shingle, some with naked hands, and none with spoons. He that ate fastest got the most. He that was strong and secured the best place. And few left the trough satisfied. Uh, I think that's an extremely violent series of images to think about dozens of half half clothes or naked children uh, fighting to eat mush out of a uh, animal's trough. Something that we really try to enforce with students is. Uh, and with adults, but it's really important to nail it down at an early age, is historic empathy, right? So you read this and, you know, especially as a teenager, uh, you're like, wow, that's really bad. And then you move on. But really stopping and thinking about how traumatic and violent this is. So for one, take a step back and picture this scene, this, this racing for food among all these children. From the perspective of the white overseers, or if they're if they're close enough to see it, because often the sort of the big house was set away from the field laborers, um, what impression would this give you if you watched these black children eating like this every day? And then thinking about the internal social lives of enslaved people, think about what this would do to your personal relationship, to your sense of your self-image, your image of others, if every time you eat. It's a competition to eat out of a wooden trough. What does that do to your opinion of yourself, of, of the people you know? I think it really emphasizes for me when we think about the damage that slavery does immediately to, to the generation. Uh, it's something so, so demeaning and so just crushingly just forced to live like an animal. And then, and then winding that back, thinking outside of that trough scene. So this monthly allowance that the adults were given, this uh, eight pounds of pork or fish and a bushel of cornmeal, this is pretty standard throughout uh, the South, this amount of food. And to put it into context, it's eight pounds of pork, a bushel of cornmeal. This is how many calories sort of an adult needs throughout the day. This is with, uh, light levels of physical activity. So this is like 20 to 30 minutes of rigorous activity a day, uh, which is what we're supposed to get. And uh, we try, but don't always get to, especially on Sundays. But generally 2000 calories a day for women and 2,500 for men. This changes immensely based on your height and a lot of other things. But generally 60,000 uh, calories, um, that should be a month for women and 75,000 uh, for men. But that's assuming you only have about 30 minutes of rigorous activity a day. If you have a manual labor job where you're working a seven and a half, eight hour day, you can need up to 4,000 calories a day to maintain your body weight. If you're eating below that, your body starts devouring stored fat and, and other things like that, and you start shrinking, you start wasting away. So that's at, a, at an eight hour manual labor job, you can need up to 120,000 calories a month. The calories that are in eight pounds of pork is about you know, 8,700, and corn is a is a really important sort of superfood, 77,000 calories and a whole bushel. So that's 86,000 calories a month that you can get out of that food. And if you're working an eight-hour day, you need at least 90,000 before your body's going to start feeding itself. And these enslaved people are not working only eight hours a day. Depending on the specific plantation and the specific role they do, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the differences between, you know, domestic labor and field labor, which a lot of you already have a lot of correct assumptions about. You're working a 10, 12 plus hour day, uh, more or less. Now, an important caveat to this that I put in an earlier slide is that um, incredibly common across the US to not have enslaved people work on Sundays. Partly it's a religious deal, but there's also thinking about the logistics of slavery. Um, Enslaved owners know that what they're feeding them is a minimum amount to keep them from dying. And so what was very common, uh, Mount Vernon especially talks about this a lot in their interpretation of slavery, is, is that 
this is when enslaved families would subsist to get the rest of their calories they needed to survive. Uh, so they would fish, they would trap animals, they would forage as much as they could. Uh, sometimes, depending on the plantation, they might have a small vegetable garden. So that day off is their day where they finish the work of surviving from week to week. Uh, and so I encourage you to be very skeptical in museum spaces or historical writings when they talk about this day off. Often it's given as a redemptive narrative to say, look, at least they got a day off. But that's a complete misrepresentation of what that day was for and really the intention behind it uh, as well. So something else I wanted to add on to it because we wanted to keep keep emphasizing the difference between the experience of everyone who essentially was in a plantation or in a house that might have enslaved people was you have sort of the white family living uh, with different degrees of luxury. You had domestic laborers who, who were still enslaved and experiencing violence like Mary Prince with sort of randomized, subjectable violence. And then you had the field laborers who had it uh, much, much different than domestic uh, enslaved people had. And so I wanted to share this source uh, from Kelly Santo Deep about black cooks. Uh, so you get the sort of the idea of the cook in the house, especially in plantations, which uh, especially somewhere for someone famous like uh, Thomas Jefferson or Mount Vernon, where there's guests coming all the time at all hours of the day, you were a 24 hour on call chef. But in a lot of these large plantations, these these owners, they wanted to eat like the sort of uh, light aristocrats that they were. So they would have their chefs trained uh, specifically. Again, we're going to reference. Washington and Jefferson a lot just because they're they're so out there and so famous and their plantation has so many sources about them. But Hercules, who was the enslaved cook for George Washington, and James Hemings, who was the enslaved cook at Monticello, they were formally trained. Uh, Hercules here in the United States and James Hemings actually went to Paris with Jefferson and was trained by the most like elite chef of the time, which is very cool uh, in a way. And they became kind of renowned for what they did. And they helped sort of define them and then black cooks in general, a lot of the staples of American Southern cuisine in particular. And then that has infected sort of the American cuisine at large as well. If you recognize James Hemings, James Hemings last name, uh, he is the brother of Sally Hemings, the, uh, the woman, the enslaved child at first that Thomas Jefferson uh, had a sexual relationship with. And I'm sure you're all aware to some degree of that controversy. But he was her brother, uh, as well as a sort of black celebrity chef. So speaking of Thomas Jefferson, this is a stock that we have in the museum collection. It's one of the, the more interesting items that we have. And I think Alden's in the chat. So if I mess up something here, uh, I'm going to hear about it afterwards. So you see on this stock right here, it's got these very, you know, late 18th, early 19th century ruffles. It's got the initials TJ and the number 13. So according to the museum database, this is a men's stock constructed from linen and cotton. Uh, it's vertically pleated. If you look, these slits, uh, oh, they can't be seen in this picture. I'll have to fix that to the slide. But there's slits in that you thread through to, to help wrap around your neck. And this style of labeling at TJ13 uh, is very similar to other items at the time where they're labeled like that for inventory, for laundry purposes, and things like that. Uh, and to our knowledge, this was owned by Thomas Jefferson and was worn later in his life. Although when he died in 1826, I guess this kind of stock was out of fashion. Uh, so that's sort of a slight mystery. It's one of those things we'll never know for sure, but I like to think it's Thomas Jefferson. It's not crazy to think that that would have come into our, our collection. Uh, but you can see him wearing a very similar sock in this photo, or this <laughs> photograph, in this portrait, which is in the uh, Smithsonian Portrait Gallery which is my favorite art museum here in the city. I love going to the portrait gallery and taking friends here. This is one of the more famous depictions of Jefferson. It's called the Edge Hill Portrait. It's from later in his life. He's uh, aged up a little bit. This was done in two seating sessions as well. So it's kind of a blend of Jefferson in 1805 and 1821, shortly before his death. But I like the, uh, the way the Smithsonian talks about this painting. Alden says it was donated by his great nieces, so we're pretty confident. Okay, thank you, Alden. So we're pretty confident it's the stock. And now I will I will confidently declare that this was owned by Thomas Jefferson and worn later in his life, even though it was slightly out of fashion. Uh, because we never do that, do we, people? We never wear slightly out of fashion clothes. 
But this is the way that the, the portrait gallery sort of sums up Thomas Jefferson. And I think this is really indicative of how sort of in the mainstream, how we talk about Thomas Jefferson in, in the 21st century. So Thomas Jefferson authored the Declaration of Independence, founded the University of Virginia, and wrote Virginia's Statute for Religious Freedom, a really important document for the early United States. He is also a philosopher, inventor, gentleman farmer, which I dispute the use of that phrase, and scientist. During his presidency, the nation bought a vast land holding west of the Mississippi River, known as Louisiana Purchase, as acquisition from France doubled the size of the United States and led to the remarkable findings of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Although Jefferson once called slavery an abominable crime when he was much younger, he consistently enslaved African Americans, including his late wife, Martha's half sister, Sally Hemings, with whom he had several children. This is known as the Edge Hill portrait. This painting is on mahogany by artist Gilbert Stewart, result of the uh, two sittings. And the brightly lit forehead stands out against the muted gray-green background as if to emphasize his bold intellect. And I actually think that's a really great point. I didn't notice how, once you see it, it's really hard to unsee how white his forehead is compared to the rest of the portrait. And in general, the color use, his, his cheeks are quite flushed as well. I don't know. Does it make him look smarter? So this is what the Smithsonian Portrait Gallery decided would sort of be, if you're going to know anything about Thomas Jefferson, this is the quick hit. And I think it's pretty fair. He, a lot of his great inclusions to the, the nation, including the Declaration and, uh, and the Statute for Religious Freedom, and also um, touching on this weird controversy. And this, it seems hard to understand, but it's kind of a simple narrative. When Jefferson was a young man, he was ambitious and he thought that he was um, opposed to slavery. And as he was older, and he increasingly depended on the way he had done things his whole life and the way his father had done it, uh, that he became increasingly conservative and against any attack on the institution of slavery. And I think it's pretty good. But the impression they're trying to give here is one of a, a well-accomplished man. And they don't dive too deep in the controversy. But they have enough of it that you can't walk away without sort of that that bad taste in your mouth. When I went to Monticello for the first time, I was really appreciative about how many names of Jefferson's enslaved people that they had, so you can really talk about them as real people and not sort of abstract characters in a story. Uh, but one of the enslaved people who was really important at Jefferson's Monticello was Ursula Granger. So in January of 1973. Uh, I'm sorry, 1973. 1773, Jefferson purchased Ursula Granger and her two children and later her husband, George Granger, uh, Granger Sr. The assumption is that Martha asked her this specifically that she had come to know about an enslaved woman named Ursula who was like very capable and uh, really well to do and wanted to have her there at Monticello. The Granger family itself became sort of an institution Inside Monticello, we're going to see they were in touch with a lot of different aspects of Monticello's function uh, for about a quarter of a century. And they, uh, to use the, the language, the, the area of Monticello where the domestic laborers lived uh, was known as the Negro Quarter. Uh, I have it blurred out for classrooms to, if the teachers want to include it, they can. And if they don't want to, they don't have to. Um, but it was just a sort of a little village inside Monticello where a lot of the domestic enslaved people lived on Mulberry Row there. And they still have some of it uh, rebuilt now. But Ursula, among the many, many tasks she performed at Mount Vernon, she was a cook, a wet nurse for Martha Jefferson. Uh, she was a housemaid, a laundress, a dairy maid. And then in 1800, she started supervising the cider making process. Uh, I love this quote. There is nobody there but Ursula who unites trust and skill to do it. So she was like a cornerstone of this household, and her relationship with the Jefferson family was quite intimate. She literally breastfed their children. Uh, she cleaned their clothes. She milked their cows. She made their cider. Uh, it would be hard to find an aspect of Thomas Jefferson's life that an enslaved person didn't touch in some way, but specifically Ursula Granger. She's such a main character there. Now, what, what I want to point out here is sort of the data we're pulling from this, besides just the idea I think it's really important of how, how included in Jefferson's life Ursula Granger was, that in 70, 1794, there's a record of her receiving, as her allowance of clothing, 30 yards of linen, 20 yards of cloth with nap, 36 skeins of uh, fun sewing thread for clothing to make clothing for her and her husband and uh, their children. 
eventually they did die in a really unfortunate sort of like pre pre medicine. Uh, they got very ill. I'm not sure if the illness has ever been confirmed, uh, but they went to essentially a snake oil salesman there near Monticello, uh, who I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was mercury or something. But the treatment did not make anything better, and it's probably what killed them. Uh, so they all died uh, right within a similar time frame with each other. But this is relevant to the stock for one. This stock is an artifact representing Thomas Jefferson's life, but it's also an artifact that represents Ursula Granger's life. If we wanted to talk about Ursula Granger, this would be a great physical object to show because this stock would have been something, depending on how old it was, because it is, you know, we think it's from post-1800 when they died, but if it's an earlier fashion, she may have been the one who cleaned it and ironed it and took care of it. Um, and then also the fact that she's given a, a pretty healthy amount of fabric as her allowance. In comparison, we're going to use Frederick Douglass again. For an adult, you were given two coarse linen shirts, one pair of linen trouser, uh, one jacket, a pair of trousers for winter that would be like a heavier material, uh, known as, again, Negro cloth uh, or Lowell cloth. It's a very coarse, cheap fabric. A pair of stockings, one pair of shoes, which is important, and the whole of which could not have cost more than $7. The allowance of the slave children was given to their mothers or the old woman having the care of them. Again, this was referenced on a previous slide if you caught it, but families were typically separated on plantations, specifically on Mount Vernon. Uh, Mount Vernon was organized in different farms set up all around the main house. And what, uh, what George Washington would do if he would put the husband or the father on one farm and then the women and children on another farm, and he would permit them to visit on Sundays. Uh, but generally, he found it was like unproductive if they lived with each other, which is heinous, to be honest. So a stock is sort of a shirt, just to cover that question real quick. A stock is a part of your neckwear. Uh, it's like an artificial collar that you put on um, above your shirt with your with some sort of tie. So, oh, where were we? Um, Oh yeah, so they were kept on different farms. So the reason that the allowance was given to the mother is because the mother was the one raising them while the father was typically kept on a separate farm away from them. So if you were not working in the field, you were immediately die, uh, deprioritized. And so if you were not working yet, you would be given just a couple shirts, long shirts that would maybe cover your private parts. Uh, if that, uh, oftentimes children were sent naked, uh, especially in the South where it doesn't get quite as cold um, all seasons of the year. And Frederick Douglass goes on to talk a little bit more about um, about his experience that this is because he was on a couple of different plantations. But in the original one, he says he wasn't whipped more, is that more the suffering came from hunger and cold about being literally naked or clothed in just a linen shirt, fighting to eat. I suffered much from hunger, but much more from cold. In hottest summer and coldest winter, I was kept almost naked. No shoes, no stockings, no jacket, no trousers, nothing on but a coarse toe linen shirt reaching only to my knees. I had no bed. I must have perished with cold, but that the coldest nights, I used to steal a bag used for carrying corn to the mill. I would crawl into this bag and there sleep on the cold, damp clay floor with my head in and feet out. My feet have been so cracked with the frost that the pen with which I am writing might be laid in the gashes. That story of not having shoes and, uh, and dealing with the damage from that is one of the most common things that you'll see in enslaved narratives. Uh, by anyone who did field work is that their feet were horribly mangled into adulthood from frostbite, from just the damage that you're putting on your feet from going on shoes or from wearing broken shoes. Um, and there is a, a lot of really terrible narratives about the damage specifically done to enslaved people's feet. Great question from Charles Wilson. In case study three, would Ursula's position be a supervisory one as a housewoman? Or would she be in a subordinate position to another slave, enslaved person of Jefferson Plantation? Uh, what's very interesting is uh, the Granger family was put in a, um, still still below the family. In no way was that an equal or, or equitable relationship, but above the rest of the enslaved people in Mount Vernon. So uh, Granger Sr. was even an overseer for a time. I believe when he died, he was an overseer on one of the farms, uh, which was not uncommon to see, uh, but a very divisive among black enslaved people to see a black overseer. And then uh, Ursula Granger was in charge of a lot of enslaved people as sort of um, the, the matriarch of the enslaved people at, at Monticello. Uh, it's really fascinating. I really recommend 
looking into the Granger family as an example of both exceptions and standards of how chattel slavery was practiced. So this is something that I think gets into the 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 controversial and intense differences between the different experiences of enslaved people because Ursula Granger was given a sometimes nominal but a serious amount of responsibility and in some ways a condescending but respect. Uh, she was treated as an expert in the things that she did and she was rewarded for that role. Uh, you can see just in her clothing allowance. That's a lot of fabric compared to these naked children running around or getting a pair of pants as a field hand. Uh, the amount of wear and tear that you put on on linen, that stuff's going to be shredded by the end of the year uh, as a manual laborer. We have stuff today that we make with all these fancy materials that don't last more than a year, you know. Um, but again, it's putting putting into that that situation is the the thoughts that might arise when you are a mother and you're watching your children naked, shoeless, fighting over food like animals. And then the person who got to be the the wet nurse, who got to be the laundress, she gets to clothe her children in real clothes. She gets real shoes and she gets to feed her children uh, perhaps a little better than yours. And then on top of that, even for the domestic laborers, um, that changed from plantation to plantation. So your allowance may still be as the cook of the house, that bushel of cornmeal and that eight pounds of pork. And then in the morning you wake up and you're making waffles out of a pound of butter and a whole dozen eggs. Um, the resentment that must arise out of that uh, must have been unbearable. But also, if that's your only experience of things, James Baldwin has a really, he's a, a civil rights leader from the 60s. He talks a lot about sort of how he internalized racism because he walks around Harlem in the 1960s uh, and he's seeing sort of the, the degradation of it. And then he goes uptown where all these white people live and it looks very nice. And because he doesn't see how Harlem develops in the neighborhood that it is, because he doesn't know the history of how America turned into this place, he thinks, well, if it's been like this now, it must always be like this, and this is the natural order of things. But there were decisions that people made. You know, The owners of enslaved people decided, we're not going to clothe your children. They decided, we're not going to feed you enough food to get through the month. They did this in part uh, for very practical reasons, in the sense that they're trying to lower costs in their business. And they're trying to maximize profit. And if you were a plantation owner, frankly, they operated on a cycle of debt. So many of them were very, very wealthy, but they didn't always, that wealth was not always translatable into cash. Um, but they were trying to cut costs with their human capital. And then also, it's really important to remember that these people are racist. They are white supremacists. When they look at black people, they see them as lesser. Often I find in academic discussions even when people are trying to sort of, they try to rationalize slavery and then they don't talk about the irrational side of it. Um, it's very important to understand the emotion behind slave owners is that they often tested these black people. They found them lesser. Thomas Jefferson, more than most of them, thought that black people were essentially soulless, uh, that they were incapable of art or society and civilization. And so you have that idea and then you continue to not clothe, you just feed them like animals, and it enforces that idea because you're seeing them act this way that you force them to act every day. And it's a horrible cycle. And it's it's violent from the top down. It's intention and it's function and it's ending. We're all extremely violent. And I think it's very important to remember. And that's if anything, the the thing I want to stress about slavery is that it's very cruel and irrational and emotional on every side of it. And I think it helps understand the institution more when you connect that thought process and that mindset of racism and white supremacy to the practice of it. It makes the practice of it make more sense when you when you inject that emotion into it. So those are a couple of the case studies as this stands now. Uh, something having grown up in the South for a lot of my life and then moving to the North and finding it having a lot of the same problems is when we talk about slavery, I try to make sure to expand the narrative outside of uh, the South. So uh, this will be expanded on further in the future to include discussions of how uh, sugar was treated in Northern households as a very tactile uh, product of slavery. 
and as well as mahogany furniture, cotton products. If you lived in a northern household at this time period, you were probably also surrounded by slavery, just not enslaved people necessarily. Uh, and even then, sometimes the, the the complicated relationship with northern states with slavery as they didn't have it and then had it and then didn't have it uh, is really important to recognize and to, to study and to take that narrative purely out of the South as well. Uh, we've also got, I think, some fun things to expand this for like homework. Uh, I always loved, you know, uh, thinking about we now live in a world where we're surrounded by more material objects than ever. Uh, and we don't really think about how those things seem to be. So when we talk about, you know, northern households buying sugar and consuming this product from enslaved people, you know, a lot of us, I don't know where my clothes come from. I don't know where my microwave was made. And it's always important to look at those tags and just to think about who made this, how would they have felt about making it, and how did it come to my home? And I think that this project for me is not just about understanding slavery and, and nuancing it, but also about thinking more about uh, what information we get from sources and how narratives are presented. And, uh, you know, what does Frederick Douglass's source or the information about Ursula Granger tell us about Thomas Jefferson and that the Smithsonian panel didn't? Uh, and I really, uh, I really look forward to seeing this start to get used in the wild and start getting feedback from students and teachers for it as well. Woo. Yeah, anonymous attendee noted that labor in the factories in the north, uh, also incredibly important to discussions of slavery, specifically when we get to the Civil War and we start discussing labor as well. So that's it. That's what I have today. What do we do? 45 minutes. Fantastic, Kevin. You didn't go too long. If you've got any lingering questions or anything, uh, feel free to pop them into the Q&A right now. We can talk a little bit more. I don't have anything planned uh, for the next little bit. If you have a longer question you'd like to ask or if you'd like to look at these um, resources some more, you can email us, museum at dar.org. You can go to our website, dar.org museum and explore it, come visit, come see us. Uh, also, if you go to our teacher resources page, the script that I've been reading off of this whole time is online. It's fully accessible, it's a PDF. You can look through yourself, you can share it with your friends, uh, you can use it. If you if you had a question about something specific but weren't sure what you heard, pull that up. Everything that I said in one in one way or another is on that on that uh, document. It's also got a work site aid. You can see the museum websites that I pulled this from, the actual text, like the Frederick Douglass narrative is free online through Project Gutenberg. You can read that there, as well as Mary Prince's uh, sources as well. So thank you. Does the DAR have any black curators or education staff? Uh, not currently. It's a very small museum, um, but we the building itself is very diverse, and uh, we encourage diverse hiring practices. Particularly, uh, we have a really healthy internship program that I really love. We have four internships a year that deal. There's two curatorial, curatorial. So they work directly with collections and databases, and there's two education that'll work with. Sarah and I, and they'll do more hands-on things, designing programs, working with people. Uh, and I'm really impressed by the amount of diversity we get for applicants because the DAR sort of, a lot of people, like when I applied for this job, I was like, oh, I'm a dude. They're not even going to look at my resume. Uh, but I sent it in anyways, and I'm glad that students of color, students with disabilities, things like that, they feel comfortable even applying to the organization. Um, and we've had a lot of diversity in our internship program, which is, has been really fun. A great question. And we, we do try to continually focus on the stories of enslaved people, on people of color, indigenous people that are in the collections that have been ignored for a very long time. Over the last few years, it's been a big shift towards talking about those things. And I'm really excited to get to be a part of it and to be in such a, it's really fun here though. Everyone is so supportive. And uh, you know, there's a lot of museums that still to this day, if I'd walked in and said, this is the program I want to do about slavery. There would have been a lot of cold feet and hand wringing. And when I did this here, there was none of that. And uh, it's been really incredible being a part of this team. Thank you for everyone's kind words. Like I said, if you have any more questions, I'm going to hang out for a little bit. Uh, but if everyone's good to go, thank you for coming on your Tuesday to this. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I haven't stepped in front of the camera like this in a little bit. And uh, it's so good because this thing was months and months of work. And it's so nice to say, Whew, it's done. And this is a great cap on that to say it's done. I presented it and now we'll wait and see what everyone else thinks of it. So thank you.
you feel free to leave, go back to work, go back to your Tuesday afternoon. I'm going to get another cup of coffee is what I'm going to do. Uh, I highly encourage that for everyone else. There's a heat wave in Washington. If you're local, don't go outside. It's like 96 and super humid today. If you're nearby the building this week, they're filming a Netflix movie here. It's called Rustin, about a Bayard Rustin, who was a civil rights leader who helped organize the March on Washington. So the building right now is surrounded by all these cars from the 60s and uh, late 50s. It's really, really cool. Uh, tomorrow it'll cool down. You can come see the cars. Have you attended American Prophet, uh, Frederick Douglass in his own words? I have not. My wife and I both would really like to. Do you know if they do that at the sports theater? think so. But thank you, everyone. I'll keep this. Uh, oh, got another question. Have you found records how the selection of a house and slave labor on the on the Jefferson plantation compared to those who were relegated to the field? That's a great question. Um, I know that Thomas Jefferson, much like George Washington, he gets very um, one thing he draws a line at is he, he doesn't like to participate in the slave trade, although he does. Uh, but I think that that was the purpose behind hiring the Grangers is that they wanted sort of, they wanted an institution to say, these are the folks that we let into the house and everything else is sort of relegated to other spaces. Um, but that's a great question. I think something worth looking into. Monticello has a great website uh, for looking into that and they have a lot of records on the Granger family. And specifically what you can try to look into is who replaced the Grangers because the plantation is functional under Jefferson for another 25, 26 years after they die. Uh, so it would be really fascinating to know who took over from the Granger sort of dynasty as the, uh, the top of the enslaved hierarchy. And how did that process work? How did they select those people? I'm gonna write that down. That's a, that's a great way, a great thing to look up. But it did happen a lot as well where uh, there were sort of families that were shifted around. We talk about as uh, Elizabeth Keckley a lot in February, where her mother was sort of the Ursula Granger of the, the family where they worked for. And Elizabeth Keckley was sort of brought up as her apprentice and then given to a different family who was looking for their own Ursula Granger type uh, like person. Everything that we have for teachers is free. We we would love an email that they that they used it, but everything that's on our website is free to use. Uh, there's stuff for high school students. The only thing that has a charge is we have these programs that will ship out to schools, and then all they have to pay for is the shipping. Everything's free. And this will be recorded. It'll be put up on YouTube, so if you'd like to share it. Um, I know one of the things that I sort of designed this for is that teachers, uh, when they need to be sick, they still have to have something for their students to do. So, you know, my wife, when she wakes up with the flu, she's still got to spend an hour per day before school starts, getting something ready for the substitute to do. And uh, these lesson plans, I'm trying to make them sort of no assembly required. Uh, so they have suggestions and scaffolding inside. So the hope is that these are something that comes in a package deal that teachers can lean on when, when they need to fill up some time or they need something for a substitute to work on or, or anything like that. So they're free, they're easy to use. Most of them will be recorded like this. So if teachers wanna see an example of them being done, they can look on our YouTube page. Uh, this has been really important to me, and I, I really hope this is important to them. Cool. Well, thank you again, everyone who's still left. Uh, please look out for our next couple Tuesday talks. They're going to be really, really fun. Um, Patrick will be doing uh, next month the uh, restoration of one of our rooms here in the building. It's not a period room, but it's a historic room. Uh, he'll be talking about that, and that's going to be really cool. And then we're going to have some celebrity talkers. We'll have Sarah Ann Carter and Stephanie Jones Rogers talking about 18th century education and talking a little bit more about slavery. And I think it's going to be a really, really fun uh, next couple months for our Tuesday talk. So hopefully we'll see you there. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday and, uh, and uh, stay in touch. Let us know how you think of the programs and we hope to see you at our next Tuesday talk.